My name is Andy Shaner. I am the education, I'm sorry, the public engagement lead uh, here at LPI. Uh, so if it's your first time here, welcome, and welcome to those of you if you're watching us online. Appreciate you jumping on. Um, if it's your first time here, if it's not, and you don't aren't on our email list, you can sign up for that um, the front table there. Uh, before you before you head out, and we, you'll get all the emails about our future presentations. Um, so I missed the very last one of the of our last series uh, at at the end of June. Um, though I did catch I did catch it uh, the beginning online. I, I was a little busy that day. Uh, so uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. I wasn't busy that day. I. <laughs> I wasn't busy, but uh, yeah, he wasn't really outside, just so you know, but uh, yeah, he, he did partake and he was just as amazed as everybody else. <laughs> um, so this, this series, um, Diving into Ocean Worlds, we're going to look at this, what we call ocean worlds, or what we didn't really do that until almost 40 years ago, uh, looking at satellites in the outer solar system. Um, which are really becoming interesting and is a real big topic of exploration right now within NASA and science. Um, so tonight we're going to get a little um, a retrospective on the Voyager missions uh, from the late 70s and 80s uh, and what they taught us about these places. And then in November, November 2nd, uh, Dr. Robert Popolardo from JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab, will be here to discuss Europa. Uh, and exploration of Europa, past and future exploration. That should be really, really fascinating. That's been in the news a lot. Uh, and then on January 11th, Dr. Jonathan Lunine from Cornell University will be here to talk about Enceladus and what we learned about Enceladus from the Cassini mission. And then in February, February 8th, I believe, Dr. Ralph Lorenz from the Johns Hopkins University will be here to talk about Titan and what we learned about Titan from Cassini. And then we're going to end it in the spring, probably after, uh, after March, uh, with a speaker to talk about extrasolar ocean worlds. So ocean worlds not in our solar system. Okay, how do we know they're there? How do you detect them? That kind of a thing. So that's, that'll be a nice way to wrap up this particular series. Um, tonight, when you get done, as we always ask, we have some surveys out front if you could fill them out. They're just three items, so they're really quick. And if you fill it out, we have... Unfortunately, just one per family. Uh, it's a two CD set of the recordings of what was on the Voyager Golden Records. So it's everything that was on the record, but on two CDs, and there's a playlist on the front and back. Limited supply. So what we ask is if you complete a survey, and we'd like everybody to complete it, but we'll give one CD to fa per family or, or per couple. So if you're here by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> You, you could, and we verify they do play in computers and cars, so so you should be good to go. Um, the surveys are by the front door, so after you complete it, find Yolanda. And I'll go tell her they'll be looking. He'll be looking for her. Uh, find her by the front door or by the front desk. I'm sorry, and she'll have the CDs there. So give her your survey, and she'll give you the, or surveys, and then she'll give you uh, the CD. All right. Tonight's presentation is from LPI's Dr. Paul Shank. He's a staff scientist here. Uh, he was a NASA planetary geology summer intern in 1979 at the Jet Propulsion Lab during the Voyager 2 Jupiter encounter. Stole uh, one he... of my slides. <laughs> Just stole one of my slides. No, I didn't. You're going to show a great picture in those slides. Oh, okay. But that was before I was born. Just so you know. Oh, uh, he... oh no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he got his PhD in 1988 from Washington University in St. Louis. He came to LPI in 1991 and since then has been using Voyager, Galileo, and Cassini stereo and monoscopic images to map the topography and geology of the icy outer planet satellite. And he's dabbled a bit in the moon and Mars. Oh, I'm forgetting New Horizons. It's there. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's also the, it's, it's chronologic here. Oh, okay. He's also the author of the Atlas of the Galilean Satellites, which came out in 2012. We have it in our library if you want to take a look at it. Not tonight, but some other time. As of 2012, he's a participating scientist on the Dawn at Vesta and Cassini missions, as well as a co-investigator on the New Horizons to Pluto and beyond. Dr. Paul Shank. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
I don't know, cute baby. I don't know how I can possibly follow that, but um, <laughs> we'll try. But as Andy said, and as the title suggests, this is more of a retrospective. It's not so much going you know, to talk about the details of some of the latest findings, although we'll touch briefly on that, in part because this year we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the launch of Voyager, and Voyager sort of opened up the solar system for us, and we want to sort of look back and see what it had discovered for us and what, what it means for us. And it's the beginning of our understanding of what the solar system really has in it. So the focus today, of course, is on ocean worlds. And let's make sure this works. So NASA has set as an exploration priority ocean worlds of the solar system. And there are, as the graph shows, several of them uh, and that we know of. And so we want to ask the questions, what is an ocean world? that answer may seem fairly obvious, but maybe it's not. Uh, how did we discover them? Where's the evidence for them? What was the path that got us there? And why are they important? Uh, so we'll try and touch a little bit on those questions. We obviously live on an ocean world, as I found out flying over the Bahamas a couple years ago. Um, and obviously, uh, there are some importance uh, in terms of the development of life here on Earth. And even in the uh, uh, desert springs uh, in West Texas, there's abundant life even in places like that. And at the bottom of the ocean, you can even see uh, uh, life there as well. So what is an ocean world? Well, it's a world with an ocean. But you know, it's probably a little more complicated than that. Um, so for the sake of discussion today, let's define it as a world with a contiguous or continuous a uh, global layer of liquid water of consequential depth. Now you can define consequential any way you want to, but let's just say it's more than a couple meters deep for the sake of argument. And it can be either on or beneath the surface, and in most cases it ends up being beneath the surface. So if you look at Earth's ocean, it's not complete. It doesn't cover 100% of the territory. It's about you know 70%. We all know that from grade school. But it is global in the sense that you can swim from one part of the other uh, one part of the ocean to the other if you really wanted to. So there's an interconnectivity of uh, the biota and the things inhabiting it from one ocean to the other. In fact, that causes lots of problems in terms of uh, the transference of, of species sometimes. Uh, so uh, looking back at how we uh, viewed the solar system, uh, and this is back in the 1960s at the dawn of the space age, and our perspective was that the inner planets all seemed to be barren, cratered worlds. We obviously went to the moon with Apollo and other spacecraft, and it was heavily cratered, a battered world, no water. And although there are claims that there are water at the poles of the moon, I like to say there's gallons of water at the poles of the moon, it's still a very minute amount. Mercury is the same sort of thing. Uh, it's more complicated geologically, but it's a heavily cratered, barren world, no water. And even in, in, in Mars, the first look of Mars, that we saw from the early Mariner missions in the 1960s looked like a sort of um, eroded version of the moon. Although if you're uh, 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 diligent enough, you can actually see traces of some of the sinuous channels that we discovered later on, even in these early images. But they didn't stand out as being very dramatic. In the 1970s, we got a better look at Mars, of course, with Viking and Mariner 9. We saw these wonderful channels and, and dry lake beds, and Mars just looked very pretty, but it still uh, was dry. It was an evidence of water in the past. There was evidence that there, there, the, the lowlands were covered in vast seas, but that they, they were dried up and no longer there. Uh, so uh, our perspective was, as of 1979, we thought that Earth really was the only place with an ocean. But what about the rest of the solar system? Well, plans were afoot even in the mid-1960s to try and, and look at the outer planets. And uh, in the mid-1960s, we became aware of the fact that the, all the outer planets were going to be lined up on one side of the sun. It only happens 100, every 174 years, so the last time this had happened was in the uh, Jefferson administration. And um, the next time will be who knows when, but um, who knows who will be in the office, if anybody. Um, so the plan was to send four of the most advanced spacecraft we could design to five of the planets 
You know, it's this date here is actually only 30 years off, but we did get there ultimately. Um, uh, but uh, as almost always happens, the initial plans uh, for, for missions of this type are too um, grandiose or too expensive, and they, NASA doesn't like the price tag. So they cut back a little bit, and, and you come up with an alternative plan, which is a lot cheaper, a lot more scaled back, and you try and make the best you can. Uh, but you actually get something very good out of it, and that was um, what they called at the time Mariner, Jupiter, Saturn, because that was all they were authorized to go to. And this was in 1972. Uh, they were, however, given the option, because of the, the Grand Tour idea was still out there, and the opportunity was out there, <coughs> geometrically, to get to these planets, is they could go to Uranus and Neptune only if they succeeded at Jupiter and Saturn, which sort of makes sense. If you don't succeed there, you're not going to succeed at the other ones either. But um, then, of course, the, the launch was in 1977, and I was one year out of high school uh, as a bicentennial graduate. Um, and this is a clipping uh, from my scrapbook. Um, I was I guess you'd call me a space groupie. I collected newspaper clippings of the space program uh, dating back to Apollo 8 or so, or actually Apollo 1. Um, I still have those scrapbooks. Uh, sort of a historical record. This was before the internet, of course. Uh, and this was the only record we, we, you could get. It was the newspaper. You know, it's a sheet of paper with type on it. And <laughs> it's del delivered to your home, wow. I think. I think, well, maybe not anymore, but anyway, um, uh, an interesting concept. Um, I actually used to deliver them uh, one or two years, I think. But anyway, uh, so this is the flight plan, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, and if approved uh, success after a success at Saturn, on to Uranus and Neptune, and, and that story is a great one. But let's talk a little bit about what the uh, MJS team, or what uh, was then renamed Voyager, expected to find at Jupiter and Saturn. And this is actually a recent uh, telescopic image from an amateur astronomer, I don't know his name, but it actually is very representative of the quality of images that we had at the time. Um, and Saturn and Jupiter were the primary targets. They're giant planets, you know, 10 to 20 times larger than the planet Earth, uh, and the glorious ring system around Saturn. We didn't know about the one at Jupiter at the time. Uh, so they were obviously the main targets. So we we're interested about what the chemistry was, what the cloud motions were, what the structure of the rings were, that sort of thing. But as far as the satellites go, um, they were very mysterious. They were basically smudges in the sky. Uh, this is a drawing based on what it was one of the best, um, well, I wouldn't call it necessarily the best, but it's the most detailed drawing of Ganymede I think that was ever made before the telescopic era, I'm mean, sorry, before the space age rather. And you can see there's not much to, not much to say there. Uh, we did actually see a large dark area when we did get there, but um, this map doesn't tell us anything. And this is an actual uh, uh, um, copy of a lithograph uh, uh, that was released by the project uh, shortly after launch to get people interested in what we were going to see. And this is the best they could come up with. So um, based on what the scientific understanding was of the day, and I'm particularly amused by Ganymede and its floating icebergs, um, uh, but it, it doesn't really say very much um, uh, because we didn't really know. Uh, we actually didn't have, we, we had a fair idea what the diameters were, but, but we, they weren't exactly correct. They're off by about 10%, I think, in some cases. Um, but we really didn't know what was on their surfaces other than the, the fact that Ganymede and Callisto and Europa, the, the uh, three of the largest moons of Saturn, um, Jupiter, had icy surfaces. So we knew there was some um, ice there. Io, the innermost, did not. So that was a peculiarity right there. And we knew that their densities increased as you went in towards Jupiter. So uh, Callisto was the least dense, and then Ganymede, and then Europa was denser, and, and Io was the densest. Both of those had densities very similar to, and, and sizes similar to its moon. So that was also something that attracted people's attention. Um, but that's, that's the best they could come up with. So, uh, But there were hints that something was amiss in the Jupiter system. And the first hint was that there was a glowing torus of light uh, that coincided with Io's orbit. And this is one of the telescopic observations that showed it. There's primarily in the ultraviolet, also, though I think there were some yellow emissions as well. 
And it's just basically a, a donut, if you will, that coincided with Io's orbit. And it corresponded with the emission lines of sodium. And, and sodium is a fairly common element on Earth. Anybody remember where you see it commonly by any chance? Salt. Salt, yes, obviously, salt. Uh, sodium chloride. So that led to the suggestion that uh, maybe Io, which doesn't have a water ice signature, lost its ocean, or its, not, or its water layer, if you will, its ice layer, and it, due to evaporation, uh, the exact cause of the evaporation is not quite clear, but it then would represent uh, a concentration of the salt on the surface. So basically, uh, Io would be a giant salt pan. That was, the, that was the concept that was proposed. This was in 1976, uh, a year before launch. Um, uh, so they called it the salt flat model. This is a salt pan in, in uh, Peru, I think. Um, there are some, it wasn't necessarily a universally accepted idea. There wasn't a lot to support it, except the, the, the sodium emissions and, and the lack of uh, water ice. Um, but it was a possibility, and, and it was an intriguing one. And the, the donut, the torus, would be the result of radiation sputtering of, of sodium ions off the surface into, into Io's orbit. So there would have to be some mechanism to lift it off the surface. The other uh, odd thing was there were unexplained um, outbursts, if you will, or increases in brightness that Io occasionally underwent uh, sporadically, there was no set pattern, in the tel telescopic observations of the day, primarily at the thermal wavelengths, in this case five meters, uh, five microns, not five meters. Um, and this report was actually published just a month before the encounter. And if you read this, it says that basically they don't really know uh, what the cause of this, these emissions are. They do discuss the option that this is some sort of um, geologic activity, but they don't have any evidence for it. So they sort of waffle and say, oh, we don't really know. But it's kind of a missed opportunity to make a, a daring prediction. Uh, they could have been more uh, adventurous, uh, to, uh, in, in other words. Um, Geologic activity on the other moons of uh, Jupiter was not really expected. Uh, let's read this. Tidal D spinning may have provided a moderate internal heat source for the Galilean satellites early in their lifetimes. So basically, it might have provided a little heat, but only in the early period, and then after that, quiet time. So the expect expectation, and this is in a, a book about the Jupiter system published during the, uh, the year of launch, um, predicted that there wasn't really going to be much to look at in the, uh, Galileans, the icy Galilean satellites, even the Isle, for that matter. But then, uh, a group led by Stan Peel uh, made a very daring uh, prediction. They looked at the tidal uh, process more carefully. The prediction in the previous slide uh, related to uh, de-spinning, which is uh, the assumption that the satellites were spinning fast and then they slowed down and became tidally locked, which they are today. So they always, like the moon, our moon, always put the same face towards Jupiter. So they rotate like this around the body. So they do that in the Jupiter system as well. But the theory is that they were faster and then the tidal forces damp that down and, and lock them in. But there's other tides. There's a daily tide because the orbits are not circular, so it gets closer and further away. So the hypothesis here is that that flexing, that, that uh, squeezing of the silly putty, if you will, uh, of the uh, satellites causes, inputs a lot of heat, a lot of frictional heat into the body. And they hypothesized that was enough to actually melt a large part of the interior. And it might be evident in the pictures uh, returned from Voyager 1. And we might see a dramatically different surface from anything previously observed. And that is an understatement, to say the least. Uh, because this was published on the 2nd of March, and the encounter was on the 5th of March. So uh, they barely got it in on time, if you will. Um, but it was one of those uh, unique moments where the, the, the scientific theory uh, came out just in advance of the observations and really nailed it. And uh, yeah, I was kind of afraid this wouldn't work. Um, it's supposed to be a movie. Oh, maybe one. OK, yeah. So this is Jupiter Arrival. This is a movie made from um, 
uh, made by amateurs who downloaded all the Voyager images from, from the web. You can do that yourself. And then in a painstaking process, reassembled them because there's multiple filters so you can get the color out of it. And they do that a lot. It's on unmannedspacefight.com. Uh, it's a very amusing site to, to read. Um, much better than some of the other blogs you can read. But this shows the rotation movie. And we learned a huge amount about Jupiter from the encounter. But we're here to talk about the satellites. Because uh, Jupiter is not an ocean world. Well, not in the sense that we would understand it anyway. So uh, the, moon, the moons really uh, stole the show. And the most famous observation, of course, was the erupting volcanoes. This is an eruption plume sticking 200 kilometers above the surface of Io. Uh, and it's all primarily uh, uh, sulfur gases and SO2 gases erupting. Uh, and uh, the Peel group was, of course, right. They nailed it. Uh, and they got the credit for it. It's all great. Ganymede, uh, which is uh, larger than the planet Mercury, uh, quite, a, quite a beast. Uh, has this incredibly complicated tectonic surface and craters, and it's just a wonderful place, uh, geologically very complicated and evolved, um, unlike the prediction that, that the satellites would not have been uh, very complicated. Uh, but there's even something strange about Europa, uh, which is the second satellite out. But Voyager 1 didn't get a very good view. This was the very uh, best view that they got, and we had to wait until Voyager 2 arrived in July. And the reason for that is because of the, the encounter trajectories and the positions of the satellites. Uh, Voyager 1 could look at three satellites, and Voyager 2 could look at three satellites, but they weren't the same. It was just the way the orbit uh, and orbital periods uh, all lined up. So Voyager 2 got the best look at Europa. Now, one week before that, I received this letter in, in the mail uh, at my home in Buffalo, and it says, congratulations, you have been selected to be in uh, NASA planetary uh, geology intern. And lo and behold, it was at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California in July of 1979, just in time for the Voyager 2 encounter with Jupiter. So yes, working for Voyager, yes. Score. <laughs> so there I am, looking grim. Uh, my desk, the building we worked. We even got to go to Disneyland, yes. Um, and that is the wonderful Mr. Uh, Dr. Ed Stone, who was the project scientist. He basically was the uh, shepherd who got, kept all the cats working together, uh, which is not an easy task to do when they're all in charge of their own instruments. Um, but he was wonderful, and he's obviously very engaged. This is one of the daily briefings uh, that, that, was, uh, that led off the, uh, the summer every morning, where we, we every uh, team, uh, every instrument, gave the project an update on what they had seen the day before. This is all very good. What was I doing uh, as an aside? I was making these maps. Um, well, actually, the first thing I was doing was running to the copy machine every day, because I had arrived just four days before the encounter. They needed as much help as they could. So uh, that was my introduction to planetary sciences, was uh, getting to know the copy machine very well. Um, <laughs> But that was great. I was in the, I was in the center of everything. I uh, couldn't have asked for more. But after things settled down, what they wanted or what they needed was these maps, which uh, because they have to plan out a year or two in advance what's going to happen and how to sequence the observations, because there's 12 instruments on board or 11, I forget what it is. Everything has to be shared. The, the timeline has to be broken up so that everybody has the, the appropriate amount of time. And they want to get as much observations as, in as they can. That included the Saturn, uh, the moons of Saturn, which we had not seen at all yet. So these are maps, uh, or just two of the maps I made, for the Saturn satellites to show where the observations were going to line up. And what did I use to make these? Protractor and ruler and graph paper. Very simple. But we weren't interested in a great amount of exact precision. We wanted to know where things were going to be, where the observations were going to lie on the surface, to make sure that we had no gaps. And if we have gaps, then we, they would need to change the sequence in order to, to correct those gaps and make sure we don't have any um, missing parts of the surface. And of course, we ended up with gaps anyway because we were in a flyby and we weren't staying around in orbit. But in any case, those maps actually turned out to be pretty, uh, pretty reliable. 
uh, in terms of what the actual coverage was. And lo and behold, uh, in the years that followed, I was actually making the maps myself. So that was a nice uh, um, uh, completion of the cycle, as it were. The other thing we were doing that summer was watching the television monitor. And there were television monitors throughout the JPL complex. Everyone had a bird's eye seat of the encounters. Every image that was returned from Voyager was shown throughout the laboratory. Everybody could see it. And every day, Jupiter got a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger, more detailed. Uh, and then finally, in the last day or two, the satellites themselves were resolved. And we could see them, and they got big. And we were all waiting for, for Europa, because Voyager 1 did not see it very well, as I said. So this was the first image that came down that showed any detail. And I, I remember very well, we were in a meeting room, and we were watching the monitor, and that came up, and it was like, wow. It looks like a Jackson Pollock painting on, on, <laughs> on drugs. Um, and, you know, it's just an amazing picture. Um, and it showed, uh, it took a little while to understand what we were seeing because it's such an alien surface. But what it did show ultimately is that it's a very young surface, almost essentially crater free in this image and the other one that, that fills, uh, that completes the, the, the view down here. There are about six impact craters. And, you know, on the moons, on the moon, that would be an astonishing thing to see. Most surfaces are very heavily cratered. It's also obviously densely fractured. These are linear fractures that cross the surface. And we knew from the Isle observations that there was significant tidal energy at, at Jupiter. So this raised the question, could there be an ocean at Europa? So we uh, set about, or our colleagues rather, set about trying to answer that question. Does the geology itself, these patterns, tell us if there's an ocean underneath? Is the tidal heat on Europa, which is further away, not as close to Jupiter as Io is, is it enough to preserve an ocean underneath the ice? Because this is frozen surface. It's 100 degrees Kelvin, which I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but you know, it's minus 170, I think, or something like that, if I remember correctly. Um, so the first effort to do that was uh, a study by Casson, Reynolds, and Peel. You notice these are the same people who did the uh, IO study, except the names are sort of shuffled around a bit. And their conclusion was that, um, okay, uh, it's possible that tidal dissipation in an icy crust on Europa uh, preserves a liquid layer beneath it. They were sort of favorable, and they thought maybe it could work. Well, 1980, they issue a correction, maybe not. Their calculations in 1979 on a tidal uh, heating rate uh, for that situation is an error. Oops, we made a mistake. Um, that occasionally does happen. Uh, and they concluded that uh, the, the case for uh, liquid water inside Europa is considerably weakened. All right, well, okay, well, I'm not sure what that means. But 1983 comes along, and they revised their calculations yet again, and we presented an argument that, based on new interpretations, uh, that the case for liquid, uh, re for resurfacing by uh, H2O from the liquid layer is more favorable. The, the bottom line was that uh, the calculations were kind of on the edge and they were sort of immature compared to what we can do today. So um, Voyager and the theoretical analyses didn't really tell us with any degree of great confidence that said maybe there could be some liquid water underneath but due to tidal heating. but it wasn't a slam dunk. It wasn't a, a given. It could be that maybe the calculations were not uh, reliable. So Voyager really couldn't tell us from that perspective. What does the geology then tell us? We see these fracture patterns. Do they mean anything? And I sort of get into the story here uh, because I saw these images when I was an intern at, uh, at JPL. And of course, I was interested in them as a geologist. I was a geology student. That's why I was picked. Uh, one of the reasons. And, and my professor was uh, Dr. Carl Seifert, and those of you who are astronomers will recognize that name. Uh, his father actually was the discoverer of Seifert galaxies. So um, if anybody knows what those are, I actually don't, but um, they're, they're sort of like halfway between quasars and something or other. But anyway, um, so uh, we looked at this image, and I noticed something peculiar in this area and, and did this mapping exercise here. There's these dark features which look 
when they're actually appropriately called wedge-shaped bands because they look like wedges. Um, but if you uh, move the blocks on one side over and realign it to close these bands, features line up. And that's a sign of faulting. Slight strike slip faulting like the San Andreas fault. Um, it's also a sign of spreading that these uh, blocks have actually pulled apart and you can fit them back together like a jigsaw puzzle. That indicates that things are sliding around. That's kind of interesting. What does it mean specifically for the interior? Well, that was harder to tell because this is the best image we had. We didn't really have, this is about, the smallest feature you can resolve is about two kilometers, and obviously we got much better than that since then, but it wasn't really enough to really say anything more than this. So it could be that it, the ice is floating on water and moving like sea ice does. And many of you have seen pictures of sea ice where it splits apart and then you can sort of sail a boat through it, that sort of thing. And icebreakers do it all the time. But Voyager couldn't really tell us again. Voyager told us there was something very interesting going on, but we needed to go back. OK, so jump forward a year and a half or so, August 1981, go, we get to Saturn. There are two objects of, of interest here. There's the rings, obviously, but, but there's Titan, which is like the second largest satellite in the solar system. It's a little bit smaller than Ganymede uh, by a small margin. But it was covered in this organic rich haze, if you will. It looked like a fuzzy tennis ball. Voyager didn't have a radar instrument and it didn't have infrared cameras, so it couldn't really see through the haze. So we didn't know what the surface was doing. Uh, we also didn't know what the interior was doing, for that matter. But then there was tiny Enceladus. Enceladus is a small icy moon about the size of the state of Louisiana. Think about that. It's a really small place. But it had, Voyager got this view, as it, was, it was its best view, it looks looking over the North Pole, it's important to remember for later on. Um, but it has a complicated uh, surface, lots of smooth areas and these ridges and some fractures running up. It's almost like an echo, a small echo of, of what we saw at Europa, although it looks different. So there's something strange going on on, on, on Enceladus uh, that is clearly reflected in geology. But no activity was observed in the northern regions by Voyager. Then, at the end of the mission, uh, 10 years later, in 1989, we get to Neptune. And the focus there is not only on Neptune and has a ring system uh, and its uh, cloud patterns, uh, but also its uh, large uh, ice-rich uh, moon Triton, which is about the same size as the Earth's moon. And when we got these pictures down and the team held its first press conference, the first thing they said is, wow, what a way to leave the solar system. Because look at this. This is just crazy. This is just the weirdest uh, surface we've probably ever seen. But there's also signs of something interesting going on. It's got this very cold surface temperature, yet the surface is less than 10 million years old. It's almost no craters here on the surface. There's a couple over here, very young. But there's evidence of the eruptions on the surface, geysers that uh, uh, throw out material and is blown downwind uh, to leave a surface pattern. Here's uh, two of them there that are highlighted. The inferred direction of the wind is here. There's a couple down here as well that are actually going this way, so there's a, clearly a circulation pattern going on. And then there's these extensive volcanic deposits uh, to the north, uh, which are actually up here, but uh, this is a perspective view. You can see these uh, uh, volcanic craters here and some smooth deposits there. There's clearly been a lot of volcanic uh, resurfacing going on, probably by, probably by ammonia or methane-rich ices. Question. Is there a specific reason why they would call that a geyser, not a volcano? Is there something specific about them? Um, uh, probably because there was no evidence that they could see in the images of an actual like volcano, a cone, or a uh, structure that, that was clearly uh, demonstrably volcanic. So it could be uh, they are sort of waffling, but they, they wouldn't usually call them geysers, yeah, I, I, okay, or plumes. Um, the plume would be the actual uh, atmospheric deposit, whereas the geyser would be the physical vent. Roger. Well, the, the geyser, uh, was it liquid nitrogen? I uh, so it was cryo, like maybe you call it cryo volcanism? There was speculation that it could be uh, nitrogen, liquid nitrogen. That was. Um, because uh, at the surface temperatures, it's actually, it's actually close to the melting point of nitrogen. It, it would be frozen on the surface, but with enough heat, it could melt. So, yeah. So, 
there's clearly signs of lots of heat on Triton. There's melting of the ices here. There's uh, activity that, that could be geothermal. It could also be solar. Uh, but there's lots of signs of, of resurfacing, very young surface age. There's signs that Triton could also be an ocean world, too. So, what did we learn from Voyager? Voyager showed us, obviously, we've seen the images, the incredible diversity and complexity that ice-rich worlds can have, and that tidal heating is required to make all this activity uh, happen. Um, probably also needs some radiogenic heating, too, but that's a separate question. Voyager introduced us to the idea of ocean worlds beyond Earth, uh, with its first discoveries at Europa. But it didn't really have the instrumentation. It was built in the 1970s. We didn't know what we were going to see, so it's hard to design instruments when you don't know what you're going to observe. Um, and it didn't have time at those places to really linger and go back and look again and take more detailed look. It was flying th once through, and that was it. So what it saw was what it saw. <coughs> And it showed us it was necessary to return the, to these systems to determine the reality of these oceans and what their properties were. So the first step in that process was the Galileo, or Galileo Orbiter, which began uh, its uh, orbital tour of the Jupiter system in the late 1990s and spent several years there and could go back and look at Europa in more detail. And this is a high-resolution image which shows features as small as 55 meters across. And the first thing it did, one of the first things it did, was to confirm that actually there was a liquid ocean. And it did so using the magnetometer. And this is uh, squiggly lines, which I, I couldn't even interpret for you. I don't know what they mean exactly, but it's just the evidence for it. These signatures are only possible if there is an induction, uh, inducting material in the interior, a strong inducting material in the interior of Europa near the surface. And the only thing that satisfies that is liquid water. Uh, solid ice won't do it. Uh, so the evidence actually came from a slightly unexpected source, and that's the magnetometer, which measures the magnetic field. And the satellite is responding to the strong magnetic field that is embedded in, which is the Jupiter magnetic field, which is a lot stronger than the Earth's. Uh, so the satellite is spinning around in that and is responding to it, and that's what you're measuring here. So. Uh, uh, based on the density, which is a little bit less than the Earth's moon, uh, is, uh, indicates that the water layer uh, is about 75 kilometers thick, and it's capped by an outer ice shell about 10 to 20 kilometers thick. We don't really know its exact thickness, but it's on that order. And we also saw this complex geologic record of ridges and fractures and chaotic areas, which you see here in the image here. And uh, the conclusion also was that this ocean was likely in contact with the rocky core underneath it. And that comes in, turns out to be very important later on. Uh, uh, this shows just basically a cutaway of the interior that we think we, we have on Europa. This is the metallic core and then a rocky uh, mantle. And this is actually probably exaggerated a little bit in thickness to, to emphasize it. But there's the liquid water layer and then the outer icy layer. And this is just a movie that was made here uh, by myself with the help of science staff based on topography of this terrain. And this is a chaotic area. And you can see these blocks. These are about 5 to 10 kilometers across. It gives you a sense of the scale. This is all jumbled up. And these areas are scattered across the surface of Europa. And they indicate that the, the icy shells are sort of broken up probably due to vertical motion of, of hot ice from the base of the ice shell rising because of the heat below it and trying to break through to the surface. And it creates this, uh, these bizarre patterns. That's an impact crater, by the way. Um. <coughs> Just let that run a minute. There's a nice ridge. This could actually be an old eruption source. for uh, plumes. All right, so uh, that just touches briefly on what Galileo saw. It also, dis uh, I should mention, it also detected a very strong signature for uh, an ocean on Ganymede. But in that case, uh, it's evident that the ice is, I'm sorry, the ocean is buried about 100 kilometers deep. Uh, so the ice shell on Ganymede is a lot thicker. 
uh, based on the magnetometer results. So, uh, touching briefly on what Cassini, uh, the Cassini orbiter found at Saturn, and you may recall that the Cassini orbiter just ended its mission a couple weeks ago by uh, plunging into the atmosphere. Uh, basically, the control gas was running out and, the, and all that sort of stuff. So it's time to end. Uh, but what it found was, uh, was equally spectacular, if not more so, and that's the erupting plumes on Enceladus at the South Pole. Remember, Voyager saw only the North Pole, so it was kind of unlucky a little bit in that respect. If it had passed over the South Pole, we might have known this beforehand. But it saw these, these ac actual uh, active plumes erupting. This is not an artist's rendering. This is. Uh, you can see the astronauts there. It's, it's um, not, not an actual picture, at least not yet. But this is an actual image, a spectacular set of images taken in backlight. Um, basically, the sun is uh, off into the, into the foyer, um, or in the parking lot, rather. Uh, you can see these collimated jets of material erupting into the surface. And this is the view from a great distance showing the uh, E-ring that Enceladus is embedded in. You can see these tendrils coming off of it as the gravitational forces of Saturn spread this plume out into a ring that, uh, that goes around the entire planet. Uh, sort of um, a hyper version of the Io Taurus, if you will. But these are all basically water and hydrogen and oxygen particles coming off these plumes. Most of the plume material actually falls back onto the surface, which is something I've been mapping. But in any case, uh, there is enough of it that escapes to create this ring. And actually, that was a sign, even in Voyager days, that there was something odd going on because uh, studies of uh, the s possible sources of this E-ring, which was known at the time, indicated that there must be some sort of source replenishing it, but they weren't sure what it was. So there was some suspicion that maybe there's something going on in Enceladus. But Voyager didn't see it, so um, again, the, the luck was not quite there with us. In any case, uh, there's clearly evidence also uh, from geophysical measurements of the, of the wobble of Enceladus that said that there had to be liquid water underneath the ice shell in order for that wobble to take place. Otherwise, it would be, wouldn't wobble. Uh, and the, you can actually sample the material of the plumes by flying Cassini through the plumes. We actually came within about 35 kilometers of the surface at one time to get a sample of it, indicating minor amounts of salts and other phases, some of which indicated a reaction of the seawater with the uh, rocky uh, sea floor, um, which is kind of interesting to consider. Okay, so this is a diagram of the interior of what we think is going on in Saldus. Here's the, the, the active area and then the uh, water uh, zone underneath it. Uh, again, slightly exaggerated. Uh, the ice shell is probably about 25 kilometers thick and the ocean is about 35 kilometers thick, if I remember correctly. Okay, so. We have these ocean worlds, and they're pretty common, at least half a dozen of them so far, and probably several other ones. What heat is there that keeps these oceans from freezing? Uh, the, the feeling before Voyager arrived was that it was too cold. These oceans would freeze out, or the, the ice would be frozen out, and they wouldn't have anything that was liquid. But um, as you saw from the animation, which is exaggerated to, to, to show for clarity, the fact that the orbits are not circular means that uh, uh, all, many of the satellites get closer and then further away as they go around in their orbits, which means that their shape changes. The, the giant planets have a strong gravitational field so that it actually distorts the shape of Europa about 30 meters. So if you're standing on the side closest to Jupiter on, on Europa, and you measure your distance from the core, the center of the body, you'll rise 30 meters up and down each Europa day. That's a huge amount of movement, and it generates a huge amount of uh, frictional heating in the shell, and it actually is enough to keep the uh, ice liquid underneath. So Voyager was responsible for unlocking that mystery through its observations, although it took Galileo and Cassini to actually uh, demonstrate that they actually exist. So oceans are found in many varieties, and we know at least six bodies where uh, the, uh, uh, an ocean is, is either confirmed or highly likely. Mm -hmm. They come in different shapes and sizes in terms of the thicknesses and how far they are from the surface. 
The Europa Ocean is probably about 75 kilometers thick. The Enceladus Ocean is thinner, probably about half that. Uh, we don't know the thickness of the Ganymede Ocean, except that it's buried a lot deeper, so it would be harder to get to. The volume of the Ganymede Ocean is probably about six times that of Earth's, and Europa at least three times that of Earth's, which means there's a lot of water on these bodies. Uh, there may have been uh, oceans uh, in the past on, on Ceres, the largest asteroid, uh, Pluto, uh, Saturn's satellites, Dione, and uh, Uranian's, uh, Uranian satellite Ariel are hypothesized. Haven't been proven, but they're there's, there's good cases that can be made. Most of them are covered by an ice shell, uh, which makes exploration challenging, to say the least, especially if the ice shell is on the order of 5 to 10 kilometers thick, as we believe it is the case for Europa. Uh, the Europan and Enceladus ones are the most interesting because they are believed to be closest to the surface, so the ice is thinnest there. So those are the ones that are uh, primary targets of exploration. Some oceans, as I've said, may be in contact, direct contact with the rocky cores. That's interesting from a number of perspectives. It addresses the question of whether ocean worlds are habitable, and some of our future speakers in the series will address this in more detail than I can possibly do. But energy from the core in terms of um, movement of material, uh, heat, uh, creating circulation in the seafloor, which allows the, the uh, ocean water to interact chemically, with the, with the rocky material as it does on Earth, may drive exotic chemistry needed for probiotic development, whatever that actually means in each case. Since we've never been there, these, are, uh, these questions are very difficult and challenging to assess. Our first objective needs to be to determine what the ocean chemistry actually is today. And for that, we're going to need a lander to go down and try and sample it in some way and the assumption that material from the ocean is actually lifted up to the surface in some way. Uh, what's next? As I said, NASA has set ocean worlds as an exploration priority. We have missions being planned uh, at NASA and at ESA, the European Space Agency, to return to uh, Europa and Ganymede. And plans are in process to try and return to Enceladus. They have to be selected first. Uh, to determine what the ocean chemistry is, what the hospitability, hospitability is to life, and also to determine what the geophysical history of the oceans is and their longevity. Are they temporary features or are they permanent features? If they're temporary, then you know, there may not be time for anything to develop. Uh, we will look at the geology more closely to see, is there a mechanism, vertical movement in the shell through diapirism, convection, or impact, large impact could excavate to an ocean that would bring material, ocean material to the surface. And a, a big question that we really don't have any idea on is, is whether Europa, like Enceladus, is it actively erupting material from the ocean today? Galileo never got the observations that were required to find out um, for a variety of reasons. So I invite you to join us again in November here at the LPI to hear Robert uh, Papalardo, a friend of mine, talk about the exploration of Europa. And he'll talk more about the details of the planning and some of the geophysical and geochemical questions that are involved with Europa. And thank you. And that's, that's me, by the way, pre preparing for Europa exploration. <laughs> And we got time for questions, yes, before yeah. grub. Say what you want about my son. That picture of Paul at JPL was pretty adorable, too. Uh, uh, so we'll take a few questions in here. I know we have a couple of folks in the overflow, and then we'll see what they've got, and then we'll, we'll come back in here. So let's just start right here. OK, he's handling the questions, I guess. My question is uh, whether there's uh, several theories for why only one pole of Enceladus might be erupting. Um, it's concentrated there. Uh, yeah. I. Um, I haven't, I have not heard a coherent or believable story as to why that would be the case. Um, one would normally expect it to be on both sides because there is a certain symmetry to the tidal forces. So obviously, if there's activity at or melting at one pole, you would expect it to be at the other. We have looked at the North Pole at higher resolution finally. It was one of the last observations Cassini took uh, that were of any resolution. And there are fractures in that area. But there's nothing uh, nearly as developed or active. So I, I, we don't know. 
Am I in control or are you? I am. Okay. <laughs> uh, on the uh, Europa 1979 slide, you had uh, A and B pictures showing the wedge on one and the yeah. lines on the other. Uh, was that a time difference? One is earlier and one is later, or what was the difference? Uh, right. Um, it's the only little technique to back up to that point. Yeah. Uh, yes, this is the observation, and it matches the, the pattern you see here. And this is the hypothesized and now proven case of what it was before the, the wedges opened and the, the plates actually pulled apart. There's a lot of spreading on Europa. We see a lot of that, not only in this area, but when we got the, the Galileo maps, which are more complete now, we could see in other areas, and they all match up. Everything lines up, even, the, even if they're twisted in their shape. They look like they just you know, fit back together again. What we haven't found is very much evidence for areas where the material comes back together again, which is kind of weird, because if you have a lot of stuff spreading around, it's got to go someplace else. It's got to disappear somewhere else. Because Europa is not a balloon. It's not, it's not expanding. So we've had a hard time finding the, um, the uh, corollary activity, which would be uh, convergence. On Earth, you have the seafloor spreading in the mid-ocean ridges, and then you have the convergence at the um, subduction zones, like under Japan or under uh, South America or even in the... Um, Washington, Oregon area, uh, but we don't, it, we haven't been able to find that on Europa. So it's uh, another reason to go back and figure out what's going on, where that material is going. So that would be indicate recycling of the shell, which is really interesting. Is there any questions in the overflow room? We got definitely got two or three more here. Who's uh, got the microphone? Okay. Mike, you talk about. You talked about the uh, Galileo mission. Yeah. Um, is that an American effort or a European effort? That was a joint effort, actually. Um, the Europeans contributed the, uh, the, the engines that put us into orbit. Uh, we built the, the probe that entered the Jovian atmosphere. I think they also contributed one or two instruments. They also contributed some scientists who helped out on the various instruments. But, but it was a... Dominantly an American effort uh, run by JPL. Uh, the problem that Galileo had is that its main antenna never opened. So we had to use a very low gain antenna. So it basically gave us a tenth of the number of images we had planned to get. So that's kind of why we kind of don't have a complete map yet. But yeah, it was mostly an American effort. But it, was, it went, it launched in 89 on the shuttle and arrived in 95 and ended in 2003. How many uh, submarines are on the drawing board? How many what? How many submarines are on the drawing boards? Uh, are you talking um, Russian for, nuclear submarines? For, for or? Yeah. Well, whatever uh, robot uh, submarines uh, well, it depends, you can design. It depends on what you mean by drawing board. There are several concepts that have been you know, uh, put forward, and people have done small studies on it. But none have been funded for actual instrument development and and actual uh, program development in terms of you know, what it would cost to actually get it there and run it. You have a problem, of course, that if the shell is, is 10 kilometers thick, you've got to get through that if you're going to use it. And how do you communicate with it? How do you exchange the data from the, sur from the submarine to the surface? Do you want to bring material back to the surface or not? Or you probably don't because that would be impossible. But how do you get it down? And you know, talk, you know, people talk about using you know, uh, nuclear fuel and using the heat to actually melt your way through, but, you know, what if you get stuck, you know? So it, it's a technological challenge. Uh, would, how much would it weigh? How would you get it onto the surface? All these questions have to be answered, but they're, it, the concepts are certainly out there. I don't know how many have been made, but probably half a dozen, probably, something like that. Paul, up, up here. Okay, and then we'll go to... Um, is there a reliable way right now with the way that we're exploring right now with what we have done without that lander actually getting there to determine if there's enough sub-oceanic subsurface heat from whatever factors causing it tidal or decay heat 
that we know reasonably well that there could be enough heat to cause that volcanic activity so that there is that chemistry mixing with the ocean? I think that's that's potentially very difficult to do. You could possibly do it with a close orbiter in a circular orbit and actually measure the gravity field like you can do on Earth or we've done on the moon, for example. Uh, you would really need to get a signature that said there was something on the surface of the seafloor that was not in the ice shell and separate the two and see that there's some sort of anomaly because you're not going to see it thermally. Um, well, you might possibly, if there's a large, huge plume of volcanic eruptions on the seafloor, there would be a rising plume over it. And you might see a, 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 a sort of like a hazy sort of temperature anomaly in the icy shell, perhaps. But you, again, would have to get a, a detailed map uh, at high resolution uh, of the gravity type or some other me uh, measurement. Um, but with the current mission design they have, it would probably be very difficult. To do that. But yeah, that would be a key thing to, to look for. Uh, I'm trying to think maybe, I don't think the radar instruments would get through the ice shell uh, far enough. They would stop at the, at the water interface probably, so we probably couldn't do that. But I might be wrong. I recall uh, some months ago seeing a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of Europa mm -hmm. that showed plumes coming out that were reminiscent of Enceladus, and I'm wondering if this could be a dead ringer for a Europa ocean. Um, yeah, those observations have been very tricky to get uh, because of the brightness of Jupiter itself. It, it's hard to get a really strong signal. And they're at the margin of detection. So there's a little bit of skepticism uh, as to whether they're real. Don't quote me. I, I never said that. Um, um, uh, but they're certainly provocative, and they do suggest there's something. But the question is, what is the mechanism? Because they're difficult. We, they're at so low a resolution, we cannot correlate them with a specific geologic feature. We don't know whether they came from something that would be a source, or whether maybe it's not uh, from the surface. Maybe it's some sort of solar flare hit the surface and caused a, a flare up of particles or something like that, but um, or, or some other weird mechanism that we don't understand yet. But it's definitely something we've looked at. They've looked at it many times, a couple dozen times, and they've only seen it like twice. So it's very sporadic. Um, that's another problem. It's like, what, what's the mechanism? Is it just a random eruption? Because the Enceladus plumes are continuous. They just keep going. But this would indicate that either the European plumes aren't getting high enough to, to detect or accept every once in a while or, or there's some, it's a very complicated story but it's a very interesting one so you know, definitely it's a high priority when we go back and we do have plans to go back in the next uh, decade launch somewhere in the 2022 time 20, 2023 time frame and and bob will talk about that in november and specifically Okay, so you certainly suggested that when Voyager launched, we, they didn't know that the moons were going to take the spotlight the way they did. Yeah. So they were focusing man, Jupiter, Saturn, this is the main focus. So was Voyager a spacecraft which, let's say, after they get to Jupiter, they go, wow, the moons are really interesting. Were they able to reprogram, uh, adjust the schedule, adjust the photography, adjust the data to uh, look at the moons more on um, that spacecraft? Yes, because there were two spacecraft separated by... An by a certain interval, I, in, um, for in the case of Jupiter, the first one was in March, the second one was in July, they could actually make some adjustments. They couldn't change the trajectory because they had to get to Saturn. If they change the trajectory, they're not going to get to Saturn. So there, the distance to Europa was fixed. So they couldn't really change anything with that. They couldn't get any closer, which is what they should have done, but they couldn't, or would have been nice. But they were able to change a couple things. Um, they discovered a ring in March, so they took more observations, better observations in July. Uh, they discovered the volcanoes in Isle, so they did more observations, although they were more distant. They tried to take a movie, for example. It didn't show much, but they tried. So they did make some adjustments, and the same thing happened at Saturn. The first one was in November, the second one was the following August. 
So they took those discoveries and, and changed the flight panel. They didn't change the flight trajectory, but they changed the observation sequences a little bit to get more observations of particular ring features or, or um, Enceladus, for example. They tried to get more pictures of Enceladus, things like that. Um, so definitely they were able to take advantage of that, but you know, there's not a lot of time in those few months to change the schedule you've already designed. But they had the flexibility to make a couple changes, yeah. It was very interesting. Were there any in the other room? Regarding no, no questions in the room. Okay. Regarding your comment that uh, the separation process doesn't seem to close again. I, would you would you consider that the tidal um, movements, which are generating the the heat, increases the general molecular uh, energy, and things are going to expand secondary to that, and there therefore is not a force that brings them back together unless it cools. Um, you can uh, you can calculate what that would be, and it's like a fraction of a percent of the total volume. So the expansion wouldn't be very much. The much larger factor would be in the melting, just to transition from liquid uh, from solid to liquid, uh, or actually the other way around. The freezing, and we know from our refrigerators, our freezers, that ice expands when it freezes. The ice cubes get 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 taller. Um, that's a much larger effect. Um, uh, anytime you heat anything, it gets there's a little bit of expansion, but just ice is very peculiar. It's a very unique material. It has the property of expanding when it freezes rather than the opposite. So that would be a much larger effect uh, th than just simply warming it up. Um, but it would not be enough to explain this. This is like a, in this local area right here, it's about 25% expansion. So that's a huge amount. There's material, when it opened up, it allowed the, the, the lower part of the crust, the icy shell, to actually move as a glacier and fill in the gap between them. That's why you have the dark material in, in those cracks. Um, but whenever you displace anything somewhere else, it has to converge. And we can't find that yet. So ocean worlds, I'm assuming that's H2O, water oceans. What about Titan? You've got liquid methane. Is that floating yeah. on top of the liquid water? How thick is it? How does that affect the chemistry? Um, in, in this particular case, we're, we're talking, I, would, I didn't talk very much about Titan at all, but I was referring to uh, the concept of an, a liquid water ocean deep underneath the surface, like maybe 100 kilometers underneath. But you also have the complication, as you just mentioned, of surface material. In this case, um, I think I actually have a backup image, I can show that. There. Um, we actually do see lakes. Uh, it's a little, yeah, that spotlight is right over the image. But um, uh, the dark area right here and over there is a lake. And it's low lying and it is liquid methane with ethane. Um, but they only cover a small fraction of the surface, small lakes in the northern areas, uh, North Pole area, and a little bit in the south too. So it's not a global uh, thing. It's a small, uh, isolated lakes. Uh, the ocean of Mars that used to exist was much more extensive than this. But it is an important uh, surface process because vast areas on Titan have been eroded by channels uh, indicating rainfall. And you can actually see occasional uh, rain clouds in the, in the Cassini images. Uh, sporadic, not very common, but they do occur, which suggests that there are, uh, there's rainfall going on even uh, in the current era. Uh, but it's more of an air, like an arid desert kind of thing. We happens every couple of years. Um, so there's a large um, cycle, like we have a water cycle here on Earth. There's also a methane cycle on on, uh, on Titan, which is uh, li liquid. Uh, 
I don't know about anything that violent. We've never seen anything. Yeah, we've never seen anything that violent. We've yeah, seen spread like small it. clouds, yeah. But maybe in a distant era, the uh, climatic cycles were more intense than they are today, which would explain all these uh, erosional channels we see all over the place. And Titan is dense with them, it's just everywhere. But it's hard to ex sort of explain that unless you have, unless you rely on 4.5 billion years of rainfall <laughs> to do it. But yeah. and we'll take one more question. Chemically, what is methane? Uh, carbon plus four hydrogen molecules. It's the same thing as um, natural gas, the stuff that comes out of your stove. So, except in this case, it's liquid. And in the case of Triton and Pluto, it's, it's a solid frozen on the surface. All right, well, thank you very much. And I'll be around to answer more questions. And uh, Dr. Shake will be out in the lobby if you want to chat with him some more. Uh, if you're viewing us online, thank you for joining us, and hopefully we'll see you all next time.